Time magazine called him the unsung hero behind the internet. CNN called him a father of the internet. President Bill Clinton called him one of the great minds of the information age. He has been voted history's greatest scientist of African descent. He is Philip Emigwali. He's coming to Trinidad and Tobago to launch the 2008 Kwame Ture Lecture Series on Sunday, June 8th at the JFK Auditorium, Uwe St. Augustine, 5 p.m. The Emancipation Support Committee invites you to come and hear this inspirational mind adjust the theme, crossing new frontiers to conquer today's challenges. This lecture is one you cannot afford to miss. Admission is free, so be there on Sunday, June 8, 5 p.m. at the JFK Auditorium, Uwe St. Augustine. Thank you. I'm Philip Demarga. I'm here because I was the first person to discover the world's fastest computing across the world's slowest processors. That was the world's first supercomputer as it's known today. In 1989, I was in the news for discovering that the world's slowest processors could be used to solve the most compute-intensive problems arising in mathematics, physics, and computer science, and find their answers at the fastest speeds. The fastest computer is why you know the weather before going outside. After I won the highest award in supercomputing in 1989, I had the seal of approval equivalent to winning the Oscar for acting or winning the Grammy Award for singing or winning a Grand Slam tournament of tennis. The highest award in supercomputing that computer scientists rank as the Nobel Prize of supercomputing is a peer honor awarded by supercomputer scientists and awarded at the top supercomputer conference and awarded only to someone who made a measurable contribution to supercomputing that includes a quantified and new milestone in computer history. After the new headlines from my winning that prize, supercomputer scientists who mocked and made fun of me took notes when I gave lectures. But in the early 1980s, nobody took notes when I lectured at gatherings of research science scientist. I was fired as a scientific researcher in December 1980 because I was advocating changing research directions. I was dismissed because I wanted to change from small-scale fluid dynamics modeling within one processor to large-scale modeling across a new internet that's a new global network of 65,536 off-the-shelf processors and standard parts. My contributions to computer science were these. I discovered how to harness a billion coupled processors that shared nothing, and how to use them to execute time-dependent three-dimensional fluid dynamics calculations that have extreme scale algebra at their computational cause. An example is simulating the spread of contagious viruses inside Japan's Tokyo subway, where 3.1 billion passengers a year are packed like sardines. My signature invention is the world's fastest computing across the world's lowest processors and it's used to solve the most difficult problems arising in science, engineering, medicine. My new technological knowledge has been absorbed into the fastest computers in the world. I invented it as the vital technology that will underpin every supercomputer. In the summer of 1974, my vague idea of 64,000 computers around the Earth was inspired by a science fiction story that was dated February 1, 1922. My theory of fastest computing was mocked and dismissed as a joke. What makes a computing milestone? 
a computing milestone begins with a vision of a quantum leap in the speed of the world's fastest computer. In practice, it takes a decade or more to invent a new supercomputer. In November 1982, and at a science conference that took place near the White House in Washington, D.C., I gave a research presentation on how, in theory, I could chop up an initial boundary value problem that's the most compute intensive in mathematical physics and chop it up into 65,536 less compute intensive problems and then solve them in tandem and across a new internet that's a new global network of 64 binary thousand processors. Only one young computational physicist remained to listen to my lecture. Even though he didn't understand my theory of the fastest computing across the slowest processors, his intuition told him that the new technology was bigger than us. Convinced he spearheaded an initiative to invite me to speak in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. Six months later, I gave a hiring lecture in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. My lecture was on how to parallel process and solve in tandem the most extreme scale initial boundary value problems in computational fluid dynamics. That lecture went over their heads, in part because in May 1983, Nobody understood how to parallel process and do so across a new internet that's a new global network of 64 binary thousand processors. That I wasn't hired was because the recording the world's fastest speed in computing and doing so across the slowest processors was then in the realm of science fiction. Parallel computing was considered to be an enormous waste of their time. It was also rejected because I was black and sub-Saharan African. In the 1980s, I was the only person that could give a lecture on how to harness a million processors and use them in tandem to forecast tomorrow's weather. In 1989, I was in the news for discovering that the slowest processors could be used to solve the biggest problems. My world's fastest computing of July 4, 1989, in Los Alamos, New Mexico, USA, was theorized in June 1974 in Corvallis, Oregon, USA. I continuously developed it during the 15 years up to 1989. Back from September 1, 1981, through August 1986, I lived a 15-minute stroll from the Greymax Heliport Building in Silver Spring, Maryland. The Greymax Building was the then headquarters of the U.S. National Weather Service. On my typical weekdays of the early 1980s, I arrived at 8 o'clock in the morning at my desk in the Greymax building at 8060 13th Street, Silver Spring, Maryland. In the 1980s, the Greymax building housed the U.S. National Weather Service. During those five years, and from Mondays through Fridays, I stopped each morning and spent five hours with research hydrologists and meteorologists. As a research meteorologist, and from 1981 to 86, I spent the first half of each day in the headquarters of the U.S. National Weather Service. I mathematically analyzed finite difference algorithms and processor-to-processor -processor emailing across an ensemble of 65,536 processors. Finite difference schemes must be used to discretize and solve the set of primitive equations that governs atmospheric dynamics, namely rain, wind, floods, and hurricanes. The primitive equations, which encode 
a set of laws of physics. We have first formulated in 1904. Eight and a half decades later, I was in the news for discovering how to solve initial boundary value problems that are governed by a system of partial differential equations, such as the primitive equations used to forecast the weather. The supercomputing breakthrough was not that I discovered how to forecast the weather on the world's fastest processor, per se. The technological breakthrough was that I discovered the world's fastest computing across the slowest 65,536 processors in the world. The precursor to my world's fastest computing of July 4, 1989 in Los Alamos, New Mexico was rejected in September 1983 in Washington, D.C. and by the U.S. National Weather Service in Silver Spring, Maryland. A decade earlier, I left Nigeria for Oregon, USA, and arrived on March 24, 1974. In that decade, the most brilliant Nigerians in the U.S. were denied jobs as research engineers and scientists, and they were denied opportunities to contribute to scientific knowledge. In the early 1970s, well-compensated research jobs in the field of computer science were reserved for white males. When I gave a job hiring lecture in Ann Arbor, Michigan on about September 24, 1985, it seemed surreal to the white audience listening to my theory of how to harness the 65,536 slowest processors in the world and using them to record my world's fastest computing that later occurred on July 4, 1989. My audience in, a, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, experienced cognitive dissonance. They've never listened to a black research mathematician who came to them with new computational mathematics from his forthcoming world's fastest computing. Nigerian mathematicians who can invent new partial differential equations for modeling the spread of the coronavirus, left mathematics where there are no jobs to become nurses. As a result of this internal brain drain from research mathematics to nursing practice, Nigerians became underrepresented in winning top scientific prizes but are overrepresented as the hardest working nurses in America. In the US, one in 20 registered nurses were born in Nigeria. My four sisters are Nigerian American nurses who worked two jobs each to pay the school fees for distant relatives in Nigeria. 50 years ago, or in the 1970s, the most brilliant Nigerian scientists in the USA became janitors like I was in Oregon. Some became security guards in Washington, D.C. or taxi drivers in New York City. In the 1970s and 80s, many Nigerian taxi drivers in the big American cities who were brilliant engineers and scientists were robbed and killed. I began supercomputing on June 20, 1974, in Covalis, Oregon. In 1974 and in the US, no black computer scientists had ever been hired in any predominantly white academic institution in North America. Seven years later, I worked without pay for five years and conducted supercomputing research at the headquarters of the U.S. National Weather Service in Silver Spring, Maryland. My supercomputer discovery that was not paid for increased the accuracy of weather forecasts now produced by the National Weather Service. As the only person that was not paid, I was the only research meteorologist that had the complete freedom to pursue unorthodox lines of inquiries.
that led to my scientific breakthrough. In contrast, salaried research meteorologists we are explicitly told what to do, and we are forbidden from conducting the parallel supercomputing research that I had the freedom to explore. Also, because I was not paid, I retained the legal rights to all my inventions. I'm a black mathematician that occupies a white space. Mathematics itself is race neutral. But white mathematicians, we are not race neutral. The nine Philip M. Aguali equations were correct and accurate. For years, many white mathematicians were slow in accepting my properly derived mathematical equations. The Philip M. Aguali equations were accepted only after I disguised my racial identity. I used those equations to win the highest award in supercomputing. Parallel processing as a subject did not exist on June 20, 1974, the day I began supercomputing in Corvallis, Oregon. In September 1983, I submitted a research report on an early version of my theorized world's fastest computing across a million processors. My $75 non-refundable submission fee was accepted, but my technical report on the world's fastest computing was rejected. That rejection of the precursor to my 1,057-page research report on the world's fastest computing that I recorded on July 4, 1989 in Los Alamos, New Mexico, was repeated six times. There are six rejections of my discovery of the world's fastest computing stopped after my 40-page summary of that 1,057-page report won the highest award in supercomputing and won it because I discovered that the world's fastest computer can be built from the world's slowest processors. In 1989, I was in the news because I was the first person to prove that a supercomputer that is powered by up to 1 billion processors can be used to more accurately pinpoint the locations of crude oil and natural gas that we are buried up to 7.7 .7 miles or 12.4 kilometers deep and buried across the 65,000 producing oil fields around the world. Parallel processing or solving up to 1 billion problems at once is the breakthrough invention used to make the computer faster and the supercomputer fastest. My timeline with parallel supercomputing parallels the development of a new high-performance computer science. At the time of my November 1982 lecture in Washington, D.C., on how I could solve the most compute-intensive problems that arise as geophysical fluid dynamics initial boundary value problems, little was known about the world's fastest computing across the world's slowest processors. So the then unfamiliar technology for parallel supercomputing was widely ridiculed as existing only in the realm of science fiction. In the early 1980s, what was known about parallel supercomputing rested in the minds of the first, of the first parallel programmers. I was the first full-time supercomputer scientist in the world. That accomplishment explains why most of the transcribed lectures on supercomputing that we are posted on YouTube were delivered by Philip Emma Aguale. It's been noted that I posted more transcribed scientific research lectures on YouTube than any person or institution ever did. On about September 24, 1985, 
I gave a higher lecture on the fastest computing across the slowest processors and gave that lecture at the research laboratory of the federal agency called the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. That research laboratory was in Ann Arbor, Michigan. My supercomputing lecture to those research oceanographers was abstract because I lectured on the most advanced calculus called partial differential equations and lectured on the most compute intensive algebra called finite difference equations. Furthermore, I used then unfamiliar and complicated supercomputer technology that's now known as fastest computing across a million processors. In 1985, parallel processing existed only as a computer science theory. Parallel processing did not power fastest computers until I discovered it on July 4, 1989. My contribution to computer science is this. I discovered how up to a million processors could be harnessed in tandem and used to forecast the weather as well as solve the hardest problems. Before my discovery, that new knowledge only existed in the realm of science, science fiction. My contribution to mathematics was to turn that fiction to non-fiction. In my hiring lecture of about September 24, 1985 in Ann Arbor, Michigan, I was tasked to detail how I could predict the fluctuations of water levels across the Great Lakes of North America. I explained how to parallel process a site, the name for a standing wave that oscillates or sways back and forth and flows within an enclosed or partially enclosed or a landlocked body of water. The precursor to my world's fastest computing of July 4, 1989 in Los Alamos, New Mexico was rejected in September 1981 by the U.S. National Weather Service then at the Graymax building in Silver Spring, Maryland. It was again rejected in September 1983 in Washington, D.C. Finally, it was rejected in Ann Arbor, Michigan on about September 24, 1985. In the 1980s, the academic scientists in Ann Arbor, Michigan, who were all narrowly and shallowly trained, only understood fluid dynamics or partial differential equations, and dismissed my world's fastest computing across world's slowest processors as a science fiction. My explanations of emailing across billions of processors was science fiction to the scientists in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Those scientists were very narrow-minded and arrogant. They could not give 10% of the lectures that I shared as podcasts and YouTube videos, but pretend they could do so. The scientists in Ann Arbor, Michigan, were negatively affected by their insularity and group thinking. And as, as, was, then written, as was then written in Ann Arbor publications, I walked alone and beyond the frontier of knowledge. The Michigan today is mailed to 610,000 college-educated people around the world. It's published, it's published four times a year in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and archival copies are posted online. The February 1991 issue of the Michigan Today that can be read online was a special issue on the contributions of Philip Emma Aguale to the development of the supercomputer. I was featured alone in the Michigan Today because my research on the world's fastest computing was over the heads of academic scientists in Ann Arbor, Michigan, 
who at that time had never seen the world's fastest computer as it's known today. It was supercomputer scientists outside Michigan that explained to academic scientists in Ann Arbor that have discovered the world's fastest computing. Therefore, it should not come as a surprise that both the governor of Michigan and the Michigan House of Representatives that sit 65 miles away in Lansing first congratulated me for my world's fastest computing and sent their congratulations before the academic engineers in Ann Arbor could do so. The reason was that my discovery was abstract. The US government called it a grand challenge for a good reason. My solution of the grand challenge problem was beyond the reach of any academic scientist of the 1980s. As my 1,000 podcasts and YouTube videos prove, I was the only person that could deliver a complete series of scientific lectures on how to solve the grand challenge problems. To put my scientific research in a different perspective, Isaac Newton's laws of motion were defined in three-dimensional everyday space that an automobile engineer in Ann Arbor, Michigan could grasp. In practice, engineers don't think in four dimensions. For instance, Albert Einstein's theory of relativity has never been mentioned in any meaningful conversation at any engineering conference. The engineer finds it abstract to think, find, the engineer finds it difficult to think in the abstract four-dimensional space-time continuum of the theory of relativity. I took mathematical thinking to a higher level and explained my world's fastest computing in 16 dimensions. My world record speed was magic and science fiction to every academic, engineering academic in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Scientists reject new paradigms that they cannot understand. Besides my research, Ann Arbor, Michigan was never strong in supercomputing and never pushed the frontiers of knowledge in computer science. On July 4, 1989, I executed my world's fastest computing on a machine that was in Los Alamos, New Mexico, not in Ann Arbor, Michigan, as was widely pre presumed. Since the late 1940s, Los Alamos was the world's headquarters for supercomputing. It's more than a coincidence that I discovered the world's fastest computing in Los Alamos. Ann Arbor, Michigan was where my son was born, not where my discovery was born. But for personal reasons, Michigan remains a crucial place in my life story and an integral part of my legacy. I had a global view of science that went beyond Michigan. Ann Arbor is a mere dot on the map of the world. And my contribution was not to Ann Arbor, Michigan, but to science and to the millions of students around the world writing school essays on Philip Emma Aguale. I know who my boss is. My boss is the 12-year-old student in Sub-Saharan Africa. And my duty is to inspire her with my life stories and do so in forthcoming centuries and millennia, just like Euclid, Galileo, and Newton did to me when I was a 12-year-old African. The difference between other scientists and I is this. The computer of the academic scientist sits on his desktop and it costs a thousand dollars. The world's fastest computer is not an academic toy. It occupies the footprint of a football field and it costs 
40 percent more than the mile-long second Niger Bridge of Nigeria. The desktop computer is just a drop in the bucket called the supercomputer. In 1989, I was the sole full-time programmer of 16 supercomputers as they are known today. Unlike the academic computer scientist that learned supercomputing from his textbook, I had to know the explicit inner workings of all the 65,536 processors that shared nothing and that I programmed alone. As a mathematician, I was cognizant of the fact that the analytical solutions for my initial boundary value problem governed by the Philip M. Agbali equations were non-existent. My contribution to mathematics is this. I discovered that all initial boundary value problems are tractable across an ensemble of up to a billion processors that shared nothing. My supercomputing discovery is the only way to solve grand challenge problems such as simulating the spread of COVID-19 across the 1 million daily patrons of Onicha Market. What is Philip Emma Aguale famous for? In 1989, I was in the news because I programmed the first supercomputer as it's known today. I programmed 64 binary thousand off-the-shelf processors that outline and define a never-before-seen internet that's also a never-before-seen supercomputer de facto. Racism swirled around me everywhere I went. The personal attacks we are cloaked in race-neutral language. But the hostility arose because in 1989, a 35-year-old black mathematician was making the news headlines for discovering the world's fastest computing across the world's slowest processors. My lectures are not secret, as was wrongly alleged. My lectures were spread across 1,000 podcasts and YouTube videos. Many that listen to, to or watch my lectures in their entirety, their lecture, that watch my lectures, favorably compared them to those of Albert Einstein and the greatest scientists of the second half of the 20th century. When I was coming of age in the 1980s, I was often disinvited from giving the precursors to the lectures that I posted on YouTube. I was disinvited, not because the world's fastest computing was not understood to be a critical technology. It was, accept it was well accepted that the world's fastest computing is the most important topic in mathematics physics and computer science. I was disinvited because my lectures and physical presence in predominantly white academic settings quietly stirred up uncomfortable questions about race and intelligence. Because I was black and African and compared to Albert Einstein in IQ, I was deplatformed I was stopped from delivering lectures at any of the 5,000 predominantly white institutions in the U.S. The double standard was that Albert Einstein was not disinvited when he spoke at the all-black Lincoln University of Pennsylvania back on May 3, 1946. Lincoln University is the alma mater of the poet Langston Hughes, first president of Nigeria, Namdi Azikiwe, first president of Ghana, Kwame Nkrumah, and the first U.S. Supreme Court Justice, Togut Marshall. 
1946, lynching, race riots, and segregation were ways of American life. And the white press, biographers, and archivists ignored Albert Einstein's lecture at the all-black institution. As an aside, I wasn't the only black computer scientist that was deplatformed across the 5,000 predominantly white institutions in the U.S. In the 1980s, a survey showed that only three black computer scientists were allowed to teach the subject across those 5,000 institutions in North America. I began supercomputing on June 20, 1974, in Corvallis, Oregon, USA. In the film, Fist of Fury, Chinese martial artist Bruce Lee felt slighted by the sign, no dogs and Chinese allowed. Years earlier, blacks and Chinese were not allowed to enter science buildings in Michigan. In Ann Arbor, Michigan, racism was deeply institutionalized. Xin Shang Wu, a Chinese physicist, was the unsung heroine of physics. Wu was associated with the Manhattan Project of the Second World War. That project yielded the first nuclear weapon. In 1957, the Nobel Prize in Physics was denied from Xin Shang Wu. That injustice became a controversial decision and attracted public attention and sympathy for Xin Shang Wu. Her two male co workers, Shen Ning Yang and Song Do Li, received the Nobel Prize for the discovery that Xin Shang Wu made. Wu is remembered as the first lady of physics. I'm 42 years younger than Wu, and we became course celebs in experimental and computational physics, respectively. As a black physicist, the rejections that I experienced in, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, were similar to those that made Wu decline the offer to come to Ann Arbor, Michigan. In July 1989, 80, I'm sorry, in July 1985, and after a nationwide search, I was ranked as the top supercomputer scientist that could be invited to live and work in Ann Arbor, Michigan. On about September 24, 1985, I gave my job hiring lecture in Ann Arbor, Michigan. My scientific lectures of the 1980s were the precursors to my 1,000 podcasts and YouTube videos. The research scientists in Ann Arbor, Michigan, were impressed with my command of materials. But they also wore a worried look on their faces. It was obvious they didn't expect me to be black and African. Two days after my hiring lecture, I was told over the phone that the job position for a supercomputer scientist in Ann Arbor, Michigan, has been cancelled. Through word of mouth, some scientists who did not invite me to Ann Arbor, Michigan, and did not even attend my hiring lecture, learned that I was trying to invent the world's fastest computing, and do so across the world's slowest processors. Those scientists became intrigued and courted me for two years. They wanted me to come back and complete my world's fastest computing in Ann Arbor, Michigan. For two years, I hesitated and pondered on the deeply institutionalized racism in Ann Arbor, Michigan. That was the reason I declined the first offer that was made on about September 25, 1985, to come to Ann Arbor, Michigan to continue my research on the world's fastest computing. The measure of the difference between my knowledge and that of scientists in Ann Arbor, Michigan is this. 
I posted 1,000 podcasts and YouTube videos, each of my contributions to the world's fastest computing. To this day, no scientist from, from Michigan could post one such video. The first lady of physics, Shin Xiong Wu, declined to study in Annabelle, Michigan. Her reason was that she was not allowed to use the front entrance to enter the physics building in Annabelle, Michigan. In effect, I could not use the front entrance to enter the supercomputer building in Annabelle, Michigan. From 1987 to 89, I filed complaints that I was not allowed to use the supercomputer in an arbor, which was equivalent to being banned from using the front entrance to enter the supercomputer building in an arbor, Michigan. At that time, I was acknowledged to be the foremost supercomputer scientist in the state of Michigan. And by federal law, I should be allowed to use that supercomputer, which was funded by US taxpayers. To prove my point, I can produce copies of a confidential memo sent from a top official in, An in Ann Arbor, Michigan, to his secretary named Pam Derry. Pam was instructed by her boss to hide my application and join their research, to join their research group in scientific computing. In a May 3, 1946 lecture to an all-black audience, Albert Einstein lambasted white supremacy as a quote-unquote, a disease of white people. Einstein then added, I do not intend to be quiet about it. To put their racial discrimination in perspective, in the 1980s, Far away supercomputer administrators did not know that I was black and African, and I was not discriminated against. I was allowed to use 16 supercomputers across the USA. I began programming supercomputers at age 19 in Corvallis, Oregon, USA. Yet, at age 35, I was not allowed to program the supercomputer in Ann Arbor, Michigan, even though I was then the world's most renowned supercomputer programmer and remains so. As a mathematician in search for new mathematics and as a large-scale computational physicist in search for new physics, the world's fastest computer is my lifeblood. Even though I was forced to leave the state of Michigan to conduct my supercomputer research, I was still recognized as the top scientist in Michigan. Both the governor of Michigan and the Michigan House of Representatives acknowledge my contributions to science and Michigan. Thank you very much. I'm Philip Omar Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Insightful and brilliant lecture.